Well, hello, everybody. <clears throat> Here we are with part three of Rudolf Steiner and the Holy Grail. I'm John Barnwell here in the city of Detroit, and I'm here with, or not in the city, but I'm north of the city and south of the city is my best buddy, Douglas. And we're continuing a conversation that's been going on for 45 or 50 years regarding Rudolf Steiner and the Holy Grail. And on the last episode, so uh, we happened to, to bring in certain angles that can give one a perspective, a more living countenance before this miracle that we call life. But I wanted to uh, share something with you, just a very brief sentence from Rudolf Steiner. It's his Spiritual Scientific Notes on Goethe's Faust, Volume 2. Part three, Goethe's feeling for the concrete shadow concepts and ideas filled with reality. And in there, Rudolf Steiner says, materialism gives no real concepts, only the shadows of them. And that kind of sums up what we're trying to do here because uh, our emphasis has been toward uh, coming to an understanding of the, the threefold nature of the great cosmic being of Christ that incarnated in the baptism in Jesus of Nazareth and has now been able to unfold certain sophionic forces, we might call them forces of soul, that develop into the capability of being able to create a relationship with Jesus Christ. The, the great leader of mankind that, that sacrificed himself on the hill of Golgotha. And as the legend goes in the grail, that, that the blood was captured into the Jasper Cup by Joseph of Arimathea, the Phoenician tin trader, and that the grail was taken off to points in the West, ultimately to... Uh, the Isle in Britain that uh, is related to so many stories, but also through the kingdom of France and Spain. And the, from the stories that we get, we get the story of this traveling uh, provider. A grail is a provider. It, it gives you, it nourishes you. And so when you look into it, and, and I was having a conversation the other day with uh, Robert Allen Pittman, and I, I, and he brought up the idea. He says, you know, there was a lot of uh, utensils on the table at the Last Supper, and they were probably all kept as relics by the people that were involved. And so there could be many stories about the Grail, but its uh, importance in our modern evolution is its value as picture language. And all the scriptures of the world are written in picture language. <clears throat> what that does is that provides you with a means to be able to develop your thinking into the realm of picture and not the materialism that was just referred to by Rudolf Steiner as shadow thinking. And so in an effort to do that, we're going to have fun with it today here with Dr. Douglas Gabriel. How are you doing? I'm doing well, doing very well. Anytime you talk about the grail, it makes me happy. So today I think we're going to discuss some things that uh, for some people, they may not be familiar much at all with uh, what we're going to address because you're going to address the end of evolution of the earth incarnation. And I'd like to address basically putting a perspective on and putting the backdrop up here of the gifts of Christ to the human being. Because when you're talking about the Holy Grail, in essence, you're talking about the gift of Christ and the way that we become then connected to Christ in the future. Uh, and right now we're in the fifth post-Atlantean age. We're going to talk a bit about the sixth and the seventh so that people know what's coming and so that they can understand that it looks as if these are the end times. But as you know, in some of our last conversations, we've talked a lot about the book uh, of uh, Revelation of St. John and, you know, the apocalypse, because 
those images are oftentimes referred to, but they are uh, also oftentimes little understood. So it's always great to address the grail, John. Thanks for having me with you today. Well, you're very welcome, my brother. And uh, I think to, to lead off, you know, the, the other day we tried having the show and the uh, it's ironic, but it, it appears as though the coronal mass ejection was, was uh, disrupting our internet signal, so we couldn't do it then. It was doing it earlier today, and hopefully uh, that leg of the mass ejection has passed us by, and we'll be able to continue with our program here. <laughs> but speaking of the sun, and so there's, there's many forces working in the universe, and uh, one thing that I wanted to get to, because I was going to do it last week, is to share with you a, a quotation that I think is really uh, relevant for what we're going to discuss today. And it comes from the nature of initiation, the first and second occult seal pictures in the Apocalypse of St. John lecture cycle. It's lecture two on June 19th in Nuremberg in 1908, Collected Works 104. But he says, and I quote, yesterday we emphasize what has to happen to a person if he is to receive initiation. If he occupies himself only with the customary activities of the present day, he is unable to receive initiation. He must be so prepared that during ordinary daily life, he performs the exercises of meditation, concentration, etc., prescribed for him by the schools of initiation. The effect produced by these exercises is, on the whole, the same in all kinds of initiation. They only differ in that the further we go back into the pre-Christian schools of initiation, they are directed more to the training of thought, to the exercise of the power of thinking. The nearer we approach the Christian times, the more are these exercises directed to train the forces of feeling. And the nearer we come to modern times, the more we see how, in the so-called Rosicrucian training, conditioned by the demands and requirements of humanity, a particular kind of will culture, the exercise of the will, is introduced. Although the meditations are at first similar to those of pre-Christian schools, there nevertheless prevails everywhere at the basis of Rosicrucian exercises, in particular training of the element of will. The chief aim is so to influence a person during the day, even if only for a short time, perhaps five to 15 minutes, that the effect continues when the pupil falls asleep and the astral body withdraws. And so there's there's more to it, but the point Rudolf Steiner is trying to make is that if you can uh, consummate your dedication to Christ, you know, you could, if you can accomplish the chemical wedding at least uh, five minutes in a day, what that does is that you're giving Christ permission to to actively engage with you when you go to sleep. I, I mean, it's really. One of the most wonderful things that Rudolf Steiner talks about, and and but yet I never hear anybody talking about it, and so I talk about it a lot, because if you go into the ancient Egyptian mysteries, they talk about Osiris being dismembered, and into fourteen pieces, and the wailing of Isis over the dismembered body of Osiris, and they reassemble them and all of that. But if you go into that ancient modality of uh, the cognition of mankind, we had that active clairvoyance. And so the, when you go into sleep, Rudolf Steiner says that the, the organ systems of the body develop a relationship with the celestial bodies that relate to them. So with Jupiter, to the liver and and, so on and so forth. I don't want to go through the whole series. You can look it up. But that what happens, whereas it, at death, we go all the way out to the realm of the stars. We ex just expand out into the cosmos. But in sleep, we just 
go into a particular relationship with the different planets, which is a, a marvelous image to try and imagine in your mind. And But Rudolf Steiner has his six uh, subsidiary exercises. And you might, one might ask, well, gee, everything's always seven or 12. Why isn't there seven exercises? Well, there is a seventh one. And the seventh one is uh, working on reading and studying uh, spiritual science, that that's an actual uh, discipline that one can do to bring one into that kind of a relationship so that you transform the dream world after you go to sleep. Well, you've covered so many areas that basically are the linchpins or the fulcrum or the um, points of focus for grail development because the quest for the holy grail is initiation and initiation is the ability to know the past the present and the future and so let's talk about that for a second christ's deeds before he came to the earth gave us the capacity to be able to stand upright to speak and to think there's a little more complicated versions of that but essentially for what it is necessary to be a human who can have a free thought, you needed to be able to stand upright, speak and think. And then in basically embedded into your heart is your ego. And what is that ego? It is a 3D holographic representation of Christ, the perfect being who was made into a human as the perfect example for us to follow. And he perfected all the bodies that the human being has. And so really the past were gifts. The past is, the past were, past was filled with gifts from the Christ as he came down in the pre-earthly deeds of Christ. And then we also know that at the mystery of Golgotha, the human I am, the human ego was given. So you can say the physical, etheric, astral, and ego had to be built up over the past, also through the previous incarnations of the um, of the planet Earth, Saturn, Sun, Moon, and Earth. So we're in the fourth incarnation of the Earth. And during that, that is the lowest point. And so we can say that, as Steiner points out, that that's the Mars section of evolution. From the mystery of Golgotha on is the Mercury evolution. Now, when Christ gave us our ego, it still wasn't very developed, right? So then he had to give another gift, and that gift was the gift of memory. So an ego that can remember is really the basis of what we're here for, and also to figure out how that has a relationship to death, which really is a spiritual birth. So you should say death and birth. So our mission is to figure out what death is right now. There are recapitulations of these things, in the times that Steiner would call, and there's a variety of names for this, epochs, eras, uh, root races, so on and so forth. But let's just call them what he calls them, these ancient epochs. So he says that after Atlantis, there was the ancient Indian epoch. And in general, those people were developing their etheric body because the physical body had already been developed, as I just mentioned, through the pre-earthly deeds of Christ, which all happened on Lemuria and Atlantis. So then as they're developing the etheric body in ancient India, this is a long time ago, folks. This isn't the India that you know of. It isn't the India that's in the history books. It's the India that Steiner uh, demarcates by calling it ancient India. And to give you who are scholars in this, um, what we're talking about. Oh, let's see. I didn't even write that down. Um, basically it goes, it's 2,160 years and there are seven cycles and we're in the fifth cycle. The first cycle was ancient India. The second cycle was ancient Persia. The third cycle was ancient Egypt, Chaldea, Sumeria, Akkadia. You could even say he uses the phrase uh, Mesopotamian and they are together. And the next one, of course, is Greco-Roman. And we are still living in the area and in the influence of the Greco-Roman period. And as we know, the Greeks were somewhat of an ideal classical age, and the Romans basically um, subsumed all of that and all of the other pagan religions, all the mythologies, into Romanism. 
And that's what we're still living in the shadow of, even though in 1415, or some would say 1413, until the year 3573, we are in what Steiner calls the Anglo-Germanic period. He uses a variety of different names, but uh, basically it's our age. So since the Renaissance up till now, and then for another 1500 years, we are developing the what is called the consciousness soul era. And these periods, these great epochs, would develop the other two previous soul characteristics of the intellectual soul and the sentient soul. Now that's the preface to say what is happening in our time and what's going to happen in the near future. What is happening in our time is that Christ had already come into the physical realm, into a physical body, once and only once for three, a little over three years, the cosmic being of Christ from the Trinity, working through the Elohim, came into the body of Jesus of Nazareth. That was the turning point of time. That's when death of the earth was changed from an inevitable entropic death to basically an ectropic life through the gifts, the light, the wisdom, the love of Christ. So basically Christ redeemed the physical. Now at this point in our age, and particularly since around 1930 or so, and continuing on permanently, Christ is going to be manifesting to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. But we must look through the astral body, our own astral body, into the etheric because Christ right now is redeeming the etheric realm. Now that's the etheric realm of the earth and the etheric realm of each human etheric body. And we've talked about that, the etherization of the blood, the earthly and cosmic detrition stream, all of these kind of things. But really, when you're thinking about it, until the year 3573 or thereabouts, that is our mission, is to develop what Steiner called the consciousness soul. But towards the end of it, we start to develop the spiritual soul, which is the higher aspect of the consciousness soul. And that spiritual soul can reach up into our higher ego and start to pull down the, uh, the sources of what are called monastic thinking, or what Steiner calls the spirit self. Now, this is for the future, but that spirit self, and then later, and, and that will happen in the sixth epoch, we're in the fifth epoch, in the sixth epoch, we actually develop these higher capacities. And Rudolf Steiner tells us how this will happen, what it will look like. And so if we address the future, if we can get beyond what he calls the war of all against all, which happens in the fifth and in the seventh period, but in the, and, and this is what people don't quite understand how to align that with the apocalypse, because the period of tribulation they think is after the harvest has been reaped. Well, it has, but the people haven't left. The harvest hasn't left. So the people who have been harvested, they don't experience the tribulation. And then what does the apocalypse say? They go into a thousand years of peace. Well, the thousand years isn't literal, but that is a description of the sixth epoch, the sixth epoch, excuse me, epoch. And that will not be controlled by the Anglo-Germanic influence of culture. It will be controlled by the Russian and so this now opens up a can of worms. How is it that we can imagine that what Rudolf Steiner calls the mood of the grail, the soul mood of the grail? In other words, he's basically saying that the Russian people are being prepared to become a golden age when Christ no longer is seen in the etheric, but he's seen in the astral body of every human being. In other words, your conscience your love, your wisdom rises up and you literally start to communicate with Christ in this next epoch, which lasts for 2,160 years, but of course doesn't start for another 1,500. So we have told by Steiner how this happened, and it's very instructive because if you wish yourself to work with those forces that come from the mood of the grail, the mood of the Holy Grail, then we can look at basically what has happened with Russia and what will happen with Russia as a perfect example of what will happen to all human beings. Because as John just uh, indicated through that reading, through that indication of Rudolf Steiner, an initiate 
is oftentimes going quicker through the normal process that all of humanity will go through, but they're just going through it early because they're more advanced. They're, they are like Kuan Yin. They got to the gates of heaven, they turned around and they came back to help everybody else get through the gates of heaven. So that's what an initiate is. So an initiate, can an initiate already be experiencing the sixth epoch, epoch and the seventh epoch? The sixth where Christ literally comes to rule in this golden age and the seventh where those people who have gone through that golden age, and by the way, it, it's all ruled by morality and by love, in our fifth epoch, it is faith that gets us through what looks to be in the end times of the war of all against all. In the sixth epoch, it is love. And that love comes directly from your communication with Christ consciously in your astral body. But in the seventh epoch of the incarnation, uh, uh, post-Atlantean incarnations, it is um, hope that will get you through. Because in the end, as we always tell you, and in what we've been discussing in terms of the apocalypse lately, if you are one of the chosen remnants, and he says both in the sixth, uh, both in the fifth and the sixth, there are only a remnant, a small remnant is preserved, a small remnant of the followers are preserved. And he even gives you their characteristics and uh, tells you how it is they got there and why they got there. And it's because of their love. It's because they have faith now that Christ is in control of what even looks like the end times. And then in the next epoch, when they incarnate, it will be this love. But in the epoch after that, the seventh, they will have to fight evil, but not fight evil. They, they will not resist evil. They will simply help conquer evil and take those who have become tremendously immoral and help them become moral. And that will be our job at that point, finally, to redeem evil. But until then, resist not evil, understand it, be aware of it, and help those who are willing to move forward to come into a moral realm, which is basically what the sixth and seventh realms are. They're a realm created out of morality, and that morality is, of course, created out of love. So when we're talking about the future, I keep telling people, that yes, the end times are here. Yes, the war of all against all are here, is here. And guess what? That's really good. It's good for the remnant. It's good for the 144,000. It's good for those who sing the eternal, uh, uh, preach the eternal gospel, which is that we are all immortal. That's what Christ has come for, is to teach us to overcome death. It's good for those who sing the new song of the Lamb. It's actually a really great time, and the tribulation doesn't even affect them. And then they have more than a thousand years of peace, they will have 2,160 years of peace, but it will be centered on the Russian culture because the Russian culture has been longing. They have been so repressed for hundreds of years and they have saved Central Europe from the suffering of the marauding Huns and all, all of the marauding uh, tribes that came off the steppes. Right there in Ukraine, where the Rus were born, where the Russians were born, they basically created the mitigating factor to keep evil from coming too early into Europe. And so we actually owe the Russians for the fact that we have freedom right now. And in the future, because they have been so suppressed by communism and by dictators and by, by a lot of war trying to, to defend their own land, which then subsequently defended Europe, the Russians have been longing for things like the city of Kitesh, which I'll describe later, and for their missing emperor, Dmitri. And on his deathbed, Rudolf Steiner said, we need to figure out the mystery of Dmitri, understand who Kaspar Hauser is, and a third thing which I has slipped my mind right now. <laughs> Too bad. I, I forgot Steiner's final words. Oh, who I feel very bad. But anyway, the point is, is that Dmitri was a Russian. He was the son of Ivan the Terrible, and supposedly he was killed. And some say no. And then supposedly pseudo Dmitri's came back into Russia. But the mission is to understand what the longing for a moral leader is. That's what Dmitri is about. So is Russia 
Does the Russian folk so long for a moral leader? I would say that is pretty much the biography of Russia. And are they longing for this invisible city of Kitesh, which is very much akin to the image of the New Jerusalem and the apocalypse as it descends from heaven? So Kitesh is, is living in this realm that only certain people can see it. So there you have the same thing. You can see Christ in the etheric. The Russians can still see Kitesh in, uh, in the etheric realm, and they are still longing for a true leader to come, Dmitri, to basically be, who is that? That's their spirit coming to lead their soul. And that is exactly what the mis future mission of the sixth epoch is about. And that's the reason it's in the hands of the Russians who have in their soul the mood of the Holy Grail. Yes, and, and, and of course, the period we're referring to, it's, I have diagrams in my books here that cover it, but we're talking about the, the transition into the Eastern European epoch, and these are like cultural ages. And so we're talking about the sixth period. And when it goes into uh, the Eastern European period, it's 3,574 AD. So that's that's a ways off. And no one would figure that there's a way in which these things unfold gradually. So they unfold gradually so that you have uh, another lag that has to do with the integration of this new impulse into uh, the becoming a central a cultural impulse. And so, yes, the transformation of our consciousness soul age into the spiritual soul, just as if you go back with the story of the grail itself, is that uh, that happened, the story of the grail centers around the ninth century, and that's during the age of the intellectual soul. But Rudolf Steiner on rare occasion refers to the intellectual soul as the higher feeling soul. So you have, just as a counterpart to the, uh, as a counterpart to, excuse me, the junk phone calls, <laughs> as a counterpart to the, the uh, transformation of the consciousness soul into the spiritual soul, you have the transformation of the intellectual soul into the higher feeling soul. And so during that age that ended in uh, 1413, 1414 of the intellectual soul, there was brought about uh, an ability within the realm of feeling to go to a very high level of development. And you see examples of that, you know, like St. Francis of Assisi or Bernard of Clairvaux or uh, these various saints that they are so remarkable and their their capacity for healing was just uh, unbelievable, but it was coming out of that realm of the feeling. And so uh, when we look at that and you see the intellectual soul, which is the central theme of the intellectual soul development is the works of Aristotle. And so that you have the development of thinking of Aristotle working into St. Thomas Aquinas and the Summa Theologia. And basically uh, the thoughts that you have during the course of the day are, are all fashioned within the works of Thomas Aquinas. You, you use his way of thinking every day. That's the way we think. And But what we have to be able to do is now transform that just as they transformed the feeling level and aspiration centered around these intellectual concepts uh, that were abstracted by Aquinas and other great individuals. Uh, like you, what you have with us, we have to be able to take our ideas and artistically bring them into the realm of pictures. And so that's where the picture language of scripture and of the story of the Holy Grail comes into focus. So true, so true. And, and I so wonder, little... let me share one more thing because it really gives you that image because no better person to do that than Novalis, uh, George uh, Philip Friedrich uh, Freyer von Hardenberg, who died in 1801. He says, blood will stream over Europe until the nations become aware of the frightful madness which drives them in circles. And then, struck by celestial music and made gentle, 
they approach their former altars all together, hear about the works of peace, and hold a great celebration of peace with fervent tears before the smoking altars. So there you have that image. I mean, it's, it's something that one can envision as a, a future destiny that you can, can uh, meditate on. And so when you get individuals like Goethe or Novalis, and they so often give you food for thought that literally is food for thought, that it literally does nourish the, those refined centers in the brain that are so uh, significant in, in that they'd been re-articulated by the Archangel Gabriel during that period that ended November 1879. And now it's up to us to fill it with spiritual substance. And that is the transformation of the conscious of soul into the spiritual soul. Absolutely. And this is um, the key to the fulfillment of the grail. It's how you fill the grail. And some, at one point, we were just trying to give the image of the sickle moon. And then on the part that you can't see, there's the illuminated part that's the sickle, but on the part that you can't see, your name is written there. And that's really what we're talking about. And what is your name? Your name is, whoever your name is, the Christ and spirit. So when you finally attain these realms that we're talking about, you literally become a spiritual group soul with Christ, but on an individualized level. It won't be like being part of a group soul of a tribe in the past uh, with humans. It will be a new type of spiritual communication, of spiritual communion. And that is the reason that the supper is always used as an example of what happens when you go into the spiritual world, just as John just mentioned through that indication, it's through being fed. Now, if you want to study the things I was talking about in terms of Russia, you would have to go to, and I'm going to have to ask you, is Sergei Opakovyev his grandson or grandson of the original Sergei Pakovyev, right? Grandson. So Sergei Pakovyev in this book called, let's see if I can read it here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much. It's called The Spiritual Origins of Eastern Europe and the Future Mysteries of the Holy Grail by Sergei O. Pakovyev. Very thick book, fantastic book. It talks about those things I was mentioning why the mood of the grail is the mood of the Russian people. How did that happen? And what does that have to do with the future? And so in, in this book, he does an absolutely splendid job because he is, of course, Russian and one of the great anthroposophists and certainly one of the few uh, comprehensive commentators on Rudolf Steiner's opus. Now, he has two other books. When I mentioned Dmitri, he's got this book. Oh. That's uh, Sergei Bikoviev, The Riddle of Dmitri. Let's see, what's the rest of it? Uh, considered from historical, psychological, and spiritual scientific viewpoints. So if you want to understand Dmitri, so if you're really into Russian studies, this is good. Very good book to read. Then I will mention two other things. One is a little book he produced called Prophecy of the Russian Epic. Now this is going to give you basically his cure for what we were just talking about, the the depression and suicidal feeling you get as you're looking at the end of uh, end of times or <laughs> the war of all against all, which certainly it seems that we're there now. And if you haven't noticed that, well, good for you. But it's kind of hard to ignore. How the Holy Mountains released the mighty Russian heroes from their rocky caves. This is a it's called a bylina. It's basically an old epic. See, I did use the word epic today. It's an old epic, and it's a poem. And it basically says these great heroes were in this battle, and then they you know, couldn't quite deal with it all, so they withdrew to a mountain, and they went inside the mountain. But they're coming out with all these magical forces, and when they come out, they're going to conquer the Antichrist. So literally written into their ancient ideas, uh, uh, these were older ideas that were written down much later, they have this concept that below the mountains in Russia are heroes that are going to come out and conquer the Antichrist. What's that about? Look at Apocalypse. Who are we in the Apocalypse? Well, you're a number of people. Well, you get to be who, <laughs> whatever you're doing, your deeds determine who you are. But we are all the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath our feet and the stars about our head, holding the child of the future who will rule with an iron rod. And uh, who's trying to eat 
the woman and the child. Of course, that is, one would call it the Antichrist, the beast, the beast with seven heads and ten horns, uh, as well as the whore of Babylon riding on that beast, as well as the two-horned beast. They all want to eat the woman, right? And so there you have it. The Russian people already have in their uh, poetic, mythic mind the concept that their ground, Holy Mother Russia, they always talk about the holy ground, the Mother Earth, and that beneath these mountains are the secrets to conquer the Antichrist. And that's true. And what is that secret? That secret is found in the being of Sophia. So in the Russian Orthodox Church, or even the Greek Orthodox Church, even in the Roman Catholic Church, they believe that Sophia is the church. She's the body of the church. Now, think about that for a moment. Compare that to what Rudolf Steiner says about the being of Anthroposophia. She is the being who every single time you take a step in spiritual development, she is there and she literally passes through you and records your spiritual step. She's like the midwife of your own spiritual birth. So, and Rudolf Steiner says that she was literally there at the founding of the first and second Gertianum, and that she is the was the inspirational uh, per, a being and much of the content for anthroposophy and the content of anthroposophy. So you cannot diminish in Steiner's view who Sophia is. Uh, and, and so if you look to the future, you also see that the sixth epoch will be ruled by peace, by love by intelligence. That is a description and wisdom. That is a description of Christ marrying Sophia. So we're Sophia in the apocalypse. We are the soul that has to get perfected and put on the white raiment and sings the new song of the lamb and preaches the eternal uh, gospel of immortality for humans who have spiritually arisen to understand their relationship with the cosmic Christ. So we have this now in literally the literature, the, the, some of the greatest philosophers and theologians out of Russia are uh, so, so follow, sophiologists, right? They, they're fantastically in love with Sophia. So this book by Dr. Tyler Gabriel, I happen to know her, called The Gospel of Sophia, Volume 1. What's, what's the subtitle? I always forget these things. The biographies of the Divine Feminine Trinity. So if you need to know who Sophia is, go to this book, and it's a trilogy. And um, Dr. Gabriel, my beautiful wife, uh, put this together as a way to understand anthroposophy. This gives you a total cosmology. In the back, what John and I harp about and what I just, Rudolf <laughs> Steiner, I used to laugh. Steiner would start a lecture off and he'd say, as you know, in the ancient Saturn, Sun, Moon, and Earth periods, and then he goes into some deep thing, and you're going, yeah, yeah, as we know. Somehow we know that. Uh -huh. Well, you know it if you studied John's books, The Arcana of the Grail Angel, and his uh, current book, because why? He gives you the best charts in, in, in all of anthroposophy. This chart shows you Saturn, Sun, Moon, Earth, Jupiter, Venus, Vulcan, and it breaks it down so that you can understand what we're talking about, these seven epochs of ancient India, ancient Persia, um, ancient Egypt, Chaldea, ancient, or, or really it goes from ancient into classical Greece, Rome, and now in the Anglo-Germanic future Russia, and then the seventh is back to America. Well, you say, okay, how am I supposed to relate to that? What is the soul development? In the back of this is the only place you'll find this chart. This chart is not even in John's books. This is the incarnations of Sophia. Now, elements of course are in the book, but I know this because I stole this chart from, <laughs> I keep it going if you haven't, and added a bunch of stuff to it. But anyway, in here it shows that the being of Sophia started to incarnate in 2100 BC. And every 700 years, she goes through one of our nine bodies, which would be physical, etheric, astral, sentient soul, intellectual soul, spiritual soul, uh, uh, spirit, self-life, spirit, and spirit human, or spirit man, Steiner calls it. So those nine, she's going through them, but she goes through them way faster than we do. 
But it just so happens that she's developing the consciousness soul right now. You'll see that in this chart. But she ends her development in 2100. We don't end our development of that until, as John pointed out, 3,573 or four. You know, when you work with big numbers a year or two, who doesn't really matter a lot. But anyway, she shows you exactly what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to evolve. And she now has gotten ahead of us. She is now advanced to what John was just describing. The consciousness soul has a part above it that is called the spiritual soul. And really, for your lower ego, that's the part of you that is the partially eternal ego. You have three higher egos above that also. Life, spirit, spirit, self. Uh, spirit, self, life, spirit, and spirit, man are three higher spiritual egos. But to explain the top one is impossible with human words. To explain the middle one is to see Christ in the etheric and accept Christ's love into yourself and through your soul marrying your spirit, or in the apocalypse, through the faithful marrying the lamb in New Jerusalem, you attain these this Christ in self. You get anointed. You, you become, as Steiner calls the sixth epoch, is an example of a group soul for Christ and beings on a level where all of the individuals are still individual and yet they're part of one united, basically like a spiritual group soul. So as you're evolving towards this, this is what the whole Holy Grail is all about. And it's the being of Sophia. So in Russia, they love Sophia. And uh, they, they love their sacramentalism. They love their, uh, their rituals. They love the way that they sing. And they love the, the, the fact that their language uh, still has a potency to it that has spiritual content to it. And in the Eastern Orthodox Church, you can be a married priest. You don't have to get into the weirdness of the Roman Catholic Church and celibacy, which, you know, look how that worked out, okay? But in the Eastern Church, it's a completely different thing. And I just throw this in for jollies. On the altar, when they do communion, they have a little replica of the Spear of Longinus, which, of course, stabbed the side of Christ, this real Spear of Longinus, but each time that they cut out the bread, the middle, I think they cut a little uh, square out of the bread. And I don't remember whether that's Greek or Orthodox, uh, Russian. But anyway, they cut part of the bread with this spear. So literally, if the, if the bread is the body of Christ, they use a replica of the Holy Spear to pierce the body. And then, of course, they put the body into the wine, the blood. And so you have the body and the blood but not without the help of the spear of Longinus. Well, in the Grail Mysteries, there's a spear and it's bleeding and it's bleeding into the cup. So what is that? That is a, an example of really the future. It's an example of having uh, the faith, the love, and the hope to be able to move through what sometimes looks like the whole thing is going to come to an end. Could it all come to an end right now? It could. Rudolf Steiner indicated that. But do I believe that? Heavens no. I have I have the 100% proof that the love that has been given to me by the divine and by anyone I've ever known who gave me love, and the love I've given out, is eternal. There is nothing you can say or do to shake my faith in that. But then I have the advantage of having been clairvoyant for most of my life, and I could see these beings. And so I could, I couldn't deny it if I had to, but the point is I have hope that even if we have a curtailed, a shortened manifestation of the seven epochs, I 100% believe that Christ is the Lord of karma can mitigate any disaster that a human can create. I don't believe that a human, even though we do have some terrible, terrible machinations, machines right now, um, I'll just say that deal with what's called the third force by Rudolf Steiner made, and it's of course electrogravitational energy, and this has the capacity to change what the future is going to be. But I don't think that we will actually get to that. I and I don't think that the sun's going to wipe us out either, and I don't think that the new galactic super flare that we just discovered recently 
it, when it hits here in 10 years is going to take us out. I really don't. Why? Because Lemuria was destroyed by fire, but there was a remnant. Atlantis was destroyed by a flood, but there was a remnant. We will be destroyed by what we are putting into the air, all, the entire atmosphere, the entire atmosphere of the earth, the etheric atmosphere of the earth. But I'm 100% convinced that even though materialists are crucifying Christ in the etheric realm, those who believe in Christ and the cosmic Christ and have Christ on the throne of their heart, who can look through the astral at Christ in his second coming in the etheric realm, I believe that is the sanctification and the redemption of the earth. And the rest, it may go into the eighth sphere, but remember, even in the seventh epoch, it will be our job to redeem all of the immoral people who have consciously chosen evil. So we don't ever get rid of our brothers and sisters who are not evolving at the appropriate speed. We simply have to later, when we have more power and more love and more wisdom, and we are uh, literally have Christ will be standing right there speaking to us, talking to us. Sophia will be right there looking at us. We'll have the power of love and wisdom in the future to be able with our moral force to be able to help the people who have turned towards evil, even in our age. So you, I always try to say in every single thing, matter of fact, I don't know a single time that I've ever spoken on a podcast where I didn't try to bring hope because it is hope that will give you the faith. You don't have the faith now because we can't see the spiritual world, but we can have, uh, we don't have the, what we would call the proof, the absolute uh, physical knowledge. We have to have some faith. And if we have that faith, that and then we watch to see the spirit move, we will see that love is constantly, through wisdom, manifesting in our world. And that is what will then give us the power to build the future. Pistis, in Greek, faith. Uh, just as Sophia's wisdom and the great text of Pistis, Sophia, that refers to the mysteries of Mary Magdalene. Yeah, you have the Hagia Sophia, the, the great, uh, it's, it's since been transformed into a mosque in, in uh, Istanbul. But so you have this image of uh, these transformative forces of birth, the, the, the mysteries of, of the mother and death, the mysteries of, of, of Christ, that we die in Christ. And, uh, but it, we have to get to what we were going to, we originally discussed talking about. And, oh, how uh, unorthodox of you address the topic. <laughs> That's, but so, your topic, you surprised that on me, the moon reuniting with the earth. You, you, yeah. you got me on that one. I wasn't quite prepared to address that yeah. one. Well, yeah, Riddle Steiner says uh, in the re, uh, this particular lecture, I won't bother looking, I'll look up the title after, but he says in the course of evolution, humanity is becoming, well, let me start earlier. We know that someday the moon will reunite with the earth. This is known by abstract astronomy and other sciences, but they push the time far into the future. It is, however, really not very far off. In the course of evolution, humanity is becoming younger and younger and retains the power of evolving in body and soul to a definite age. In ancient India, man retained plasticity up to the age of 56 at the time of Golgotha to the age of 33. Now to the age of 27, in the sixth post-Atlantean epoch, it will be the age of 21 to 14 and in the seventh, 14 to seven or seven to 14, a uh, woman will cease to be fertile. Another mode of entering earthly life will take place when the moon reunites with the earth. In 8,000 AD, the reuniting of the moon with the earth will be of great significance. We shall be connected with the earth differently. The intellect will become more and more shadowy if man does not resolve to absorb what is to descend from the spiritual world, he will pass completely over to the shadowy side of his intellect. The intellect is now only able to understand the mineral kingdom. It cannot penetrate 
to the human being. Plant life is a deep riddle to it. Animal life is more so. Human life is completely opaque. The formation of images devoid of reality will continue until, unless man resolves to develop imagination. If he does this, the shadowy pictures will be reanimated by spiritual science and become not merely human events, but cosmic as well. We read in occult science that human souls at one time left the earth for other planets and later returned to earth existence. In, in turn, those from Mars, Jupiter, and other planets returned to the earth. All these events are substantiated by investigations of the spiritual world. And in this connection, we find an extremely significant event in the seventh decade of the 19th century. Man returned to earth from the other planets up to 1879, the beginning of the age of Michael, right? Since then, other beings from foreign cosmic regions enter into relation with man on earth. In Atlantis, Man was the last being to enter the earth. Since 1879, Vulcan beings descend into earthly evolution. They are the first super earthly beings to bring messages. To them, we owe our spiritual science. The human race does not welcome these beings. As a whole, it ignores them. This will bring the earth into a tragic condition ultimately. They will continue to descend, but man will not understand their speech except by understanding spiritual science, which should transform the social environment. These Vulcan beings from between the moon and Mercury are trying to obtain a foothold in earthly existence. They seek to be the forerunners of the end of the earth and the return of the moon. Our shadowy intellectual understanding must be reanimated by the pictures of spiritual science. Shock after shock will arise and the earth will dissolve into chaos if these beings meet with opposition from humanity. It may seem harmless to think only automatic thoughts of mineral, plant, animal, and man. Today, they are merely thoughts. But should this continue until the reunion of the moon, the result will be chaos. Full humanity must be drawn into the intellect. Incorrect and unreal thoughts will receive at a blow the real truth at the reunion of the moon. These materialistic thoughts will then bring forth a terrible race of automatic beings who stand in their nature between the plant and mineral kingdoms. They will be endowed with great power of intellect and understanding and will enclose the earth in a kind of net or spider's web. They will enclose what man imagines without spiritual science. For machinery is really thought poured into the mineral. All modern unreal thoughts will become endowed with being. And I can go on and on, but the point is, is that it's manifesting uh, out of out of thoughts is the future. And so being able to enter into this relationship with Christ, we're, we're developing that alternative future, which is that evolution, as St. Paul said, you shall be as the angels. But that's a moral impulse. In materialism, there are no moral forces. It, it, it comes out of the mechanical world, and there's no moral forces in that realm whatsoever. And but yet they want to try and and through technology integrate us into that realm, and that's the ultimate sin. That's so true. And he says, as we go towards the sixth epoch, it's just immorality. It will be an issue of will the I am choose morality or immorality, and these beings between the plant and the mineral world; those are our computers. Those are minerals that we make look as if they have some type of uh, life, self-motive, self-organizing, self-creating, and it's just cer certainly not true. It is human thought poured into the realm of the minerals that reflects back the brilliance of human thought when it's uh, attuned with the spirit. So the moon reuniting with the earth, Rudolf Steiner said, if we develop the third force, which I call electro-gravitational force, that... This third force, he said, would be able to move the planets. And at that point, we would be able to disturb the cosmic plan of, for the Earth. Uh, that's very disturbing. Uh, the moon left the Earth during Lemurian times, and that's when we separated. And, well, 
that's when we started to uh, to uh, male and female uh, were necessary to create children. Uh, really, that was the Garden of Eden, the first Garden of Eden. According to Steiner, there were three versions of that. But the first one on Lemuria, that when the moon left, it was the hardest, most dense part of the earth. And if it had not left, we would have over crystallized, we would have over uh, materialized, and it would have uh, even slowed down or stopped the forces of evolution and the plan of evolution spiritual evolution. So it's absolutely critical to understand this, that at this moment, do we have the capacity to move the moon? Because the moon, according to scientists, through entropy, will simply slow down and start to re-enter our atmosphere. And when it does, it will break into pieces. And Steiner points out, yes, that will happen. But why does it happen? It isn't because the the cosmos, or particularly our solar system, is now ruled by entropy. That's not true. It's ruled by Christ. It's ruled by ectropy. It is part of evolution that the Earth, through its different incarnations, Saturn, Sun, Moon, Earth, into Jupiter, Venus, Vulcan, will change its forms. Next incarnation of Jupiter will have at least two moons uh, and the Earth itself, but it will be in a completely different form. So it's like a caterpillar who goes into the chrysalis turns into a state of chaos and then reforms inside of that chrysalis as a butterfly. Well, that's what happens in between these different incarnations. So you cannot actually use human thinking to imagine what the future Jupiter incarnation will be like. Uh, but what John has brought is one of the big points that again and again, I like to bring. He point blank says right now, super human beings. He says superhuman men, but we're not going to call them supermen. We're going to call them superhuman beings, male or female or both, whatever, will come to us from the inner planets, Venus, Mercury, and Vulcan. Well, from the outer planets, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, we have all of our past. That's called the mothers, or that's called the incarnations of Saturn, Sun, Moon. But the future incarnations are already there, and they're coming to us. So those who are initiates, those who are able to perceive the cosmic Christ in the etheric realm and his second coming, can start to open up to communicate with these beings, uh, beings from Vulcan, a planet which is invisible, as it were, but it is uh, also the seventh stage of the incarnations of the earth. So it's making reference to a very rarefied state of being. But those beings who are there now, who have evolved ahead of us, we can which is rather complicated to describe, but all the beings are always evolving. So from one earth incarnation to the next, an angel is no longer an angel. They would have advanced properly to become an archangel. So we're dealing with basically angels, archangels, archai of a sort who had gone through their human forums, who want nothing more than to help us as we will have to help those who have been trapped by Im uh, immoral activity, uh, illogical thinking, and war. That's the evil. We're going to have to help redeem them. So imagine how anxious we will be to do that, and we try to do it now in our lives. Well, think about the spiritual beings who've gone on in advance of us towards the higher realms. Of course they want to help us. They always are turning and offering a hand to help us climb that ladder, go up the steps, go up Mount Meru, go up the seven-story mountain, whatever you want to call it. They're there to help us. And as Rudolf Steiner likes to use the phrase, it is from the ever-present help of the spiritual world. We have Sophia. We have Michael. We have Vidar. We have our guardian angels. We have all the saints and the, 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 the hosts of angels. We have all these beings who are uh, anxious to help us. If we would simply have the faith to know that they exist and then open our eyes and our ears and our heart, and then we will start to receive these beings that Rudolf Steiner called the superhuman beings who are coming from these realms to help us. Basically, they're helping us evolve into our future. Why? Because they're already there in the future. They're not bound by time and space. And so they're basically lifting us out of the linear understanding of time and the three-dimensional experience of space into a higher realm. That's what's going to happen as we evolve from the post fifth Atlantean age to the sixth to the seventh, we start to develop some of those characteristics in a nascent fashion, in, in a beginning, as a birth. And this 
to me, I don't know. I get horribly excited about this stuff. Most people on Facebook and on the internet, what do they quote? All the horrible stuff about the spider web and about Saroth and about, you know, th there are some horrible things that are predicted, but guess what? Read the apocalypse as an initiation rite, and you will see that the remnant is always protected. So if you're part of the remnant, you just simply need to work harder towards faith, love, and hope. And you will transform these future realms, whether it's the sixth epoch, the seventh epoch, or whether it's the Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan incarnations of the earth. Well, yes, you have to you have to encounter the three ruffians before you reach the sprig of acacia, see? And so it's that whole drama in but Rinostern is very clear because, see, if we don't solve our dilemma of being able to recognize the, the, the living reality of the deed of Christ, then the ones that suffer from that is ourselves. And my friend uh, Tommy Corrigan on his uh, podcast the other day, he, he said, I said, hey, if you're an atheist, you know, what's it going to hurt? Just just invite them into your heart. See what happens, you know? And it, it, it's like that. The, the, the journey begins with one step. But, uh, and the more that, like, in consecrating your meals, you know, saying grace, uh, saying a prayer, be, making the act of going to sleep sacred, uh, read some spiritual science before you go to sleep instead of uh, some action movie where all these people are getting shot, you know, or listen to a, uh, some uh, a piano concerto or, or even better, a violin or cello concerto uh, before you go to sleep rather than uh, Bruce Willis shooting guys. Yeah, you'll, you'll be amazed at the difference. But it's, and it's funny because Riddle Steiner says that when, when we sleep, actually our, our ether body and our physical body remain on the bed and the astral body and ego takes off. He says, but you know, your etheric body, well, it can, it can think without you being there, but you're, you're not aware of what thinking is going on and it can even uh, uh, communicate. You know, people talk in their sleep, don't they? And the astral and the ego is not even present. And he says, actually, that uh, part of your being is is smarter than you are. You know, and so th there's just all this wondrous uh, aspects to this that, that uh, is so fulfilling to find out about. But the more you bring yourself into relationship and discipline uh, your the levels of being and overcome fear. That's the big one, you know, moving from the fear realm of the kidneys and, and moving it up to the heart through that, that principle of love. I mean, Douglas is a testimony to that. That's what he did. Uh, he, he was on dialysis and, uh, and heart monitor and the whole deal. And uh, those were both told to him to be incurable and he changed his way of thinking. Metanoia, John the Baptist said. Metanoia, change your way of thinking. If you can transform this, this realm of being in which you, you, you focus your conscious mind, you can change what's going to be the result. And so, uh, where is it? I have it right here. Uh, let's see. If man will not unite with the Vulcan spiritual beings, he will have to unite his own being as far as it is not spiritual with the spider race. He will have to live with and continue as evidence of this nature. For much of this lies behind what many people say today. Our evolution cannot progress unless the veil of secrecy be withdrawn and these things known so that spiritual science may be accepted or rejected. And uh, that's very much to the point. 
is is the but it's a joyous journey and that's as douglas was saying this that you know you don't have to go there that's all very scary and and, and uh, dark but that's the people and you can look out on you can look on tv and you can see people that appears as though that must be their trajectory because the, what they're coming up with as a, as a good idea seems to be along those lines and all you have to do is change your way of thinking metanoia and align yourself with that that christ filled love and compassion and you can ultimately help even the transformation of those individuals who are so misguided in thinking that that we need to be turned into some kind of uh, robot of some sort, <laughs> and so it's it's we're, we've run out of time, and but I enjoy these so much I I just keep talking, and uh, but uh, I have two books as you know probably, the Arcana of the Grail Angel, the Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order with a forward by my friend here, Douglas Gabriel, the full series. The, the series of diagrams inherited from Aaron Fred Pfeiffer. And then in my second volume, the whole series is there also, but uh, with a great many more added. And uh, this second book, The uh, Light on the Path, The Arcana of Light on the Path, is still available. You can get it on uh, eBay. Uh, if you're outside the country, you can contact me directly. I recommend the academia link below because my Facebook's been uh, pretty screwed up lately as far as I can't use the message component of it. So you can contact me through my academia link below. And Douglas's links for his books and Tyler's books, they're all below and all kinds of interesting links actually. And, uh, but I wanted to, uh, close out with a, a poem that I love so much, I translated from the French, which gives you that picture language and gives you the essence of what we've been discussing. And it's an alchemical poem by the Comte Saint-Germain. Curious crutator of the whole of nature, I have known the great all, its principle and its end. I have seen gold in its power deep within the mine. I have seized its material and surprised its leaven. I explain by what art the soul within the mother's womb makes its home, carries it out, and as a grape seed placed against a grain of wheat under the humid earth, the one plant, the other vine, or the bread and wine. Nothing was, God willed, and nothing became something. In my doubting, I sought out that on which the universe is poised. Nothing appeared to sustain the equilibrium or to serve as a support. Finally, with the weights of praise and of blame, I weighed the eternal. It called my soul. I died, I adored, I knew nothing more. And so if you, if you feel good about that, you could think maybe you could, you could buy me a cup of coffee, uh, paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888 and and go up. You can get Douglas and Tyler's books. You can get them in uh, PDF forms or, or digital format for, for free. And uh, I highly recommend it. It's as I've always said, Douglas is, is my greatest teacher and my greatest pupil. And I just uh, click like and uh, Join my channel if you would, and and Douglas, I want to thank you. I, if you have any parting thoughts, by all means. Thank you, my grill brother. And I, but I also want to. I I can't forget to do this because this is one of the most important things about it. That this podcast has been made possible by the generous support of Tyler and Douglas and Vadim and Vivian and, and Tim and Gina, Gina and Neil and Christian and Paula and Rick and Michael and Beth and Anil and Anamira, all these people, James and Marilyn, Ray and Whitney. And I want to thank you all. And if I, if I didn't 
call you out. It's okay. I still love you. And uh, thank you all so much for showing up. <laughs>